At exactly 10.35 in the morning on September 30th, 1999, something that should never happen began happening inside a concrete building in rural Japan. An uncontrolled nuclear chain reaction. In the JCO conversion test building in Tokaimura, Ibaraki Prefecture, atoms started splitting faster than anyone could stop them. The air itself began to glow. Within 25 minutes, workers would see a brilliant blue flash cutting through the facility like lightning frozen in time. Plant gamma alarms would start screaming warnings that no one fully understood yet. This was the moment Japan's nuclear industry crossed a line it had promised never to cross. Before we dive in, please consider dropping a like and subscribing. The flash came from something called Cherenkov radiation. When particles move faster than light can travel through water, they create this otherworldly blue glow. It's the signature of runaway nuclear reactions. Three workers had just finished pouring a urinal nitrate solution into a precipitation tank, solution enriched to 18.8% uranium-235, fuel meant for Japan's Zhou-Yo fast breeder reactor. But they weren't following the license procedures. Instead of using the approved buffer tank and height-limited transfer system, they had been carrying the solution in buckets, pouring it directly into a cylindrical tank surrounded by a water-cooling jacket. That water jacket was about to become the most dangerous design feature in Japan. The operators had added roughly seven times the specified limit for the tank. Seven times. In nuclear chemistry, that kind of deviation doesn't just bend the rules. It shatters the fundamental physics that keep atoms stable. The moment they hit critical mass, neutrons began flying in every direction. The water jacket that was meant to cool the system instead acted as a neutron moderator, slowing the particles down just enough to sustain the chain reaction. More neutrons meant more splits. More splits meant more neutrons. The reaction was now feeding itself. By 6.15 that evening, JCO employees began evacuating the site, but the damage was already spreading far beyond the building's walls. Neutron detectors at the Japan Atomic Energy Research Institute's Naka branch, 1.7 kilometers away, started registering hits. These weren't supposed to be detecting anything from the JCO plant, Carborn surveys racing through the surrounding area measured radiation levels from 0.03 to 440 microgray per hour. Some readings jumped as high as 510 microsievert per hour just 70 meters from the building. At 8 o'clock that night, the prefecture of Ibaraki made a decision that would ripple across Japan's nuclear establishment forever. They ordered residents within 10 kilometers to shelter indoors, 310,000 people told to stay inside their homes because atoms were splitting out of control 19 hours away from Tokyo. The chain reaction that started at 10.35 that morning was still going, still generating neutrons, still glowing blue in a tank that was never designed to contain it, and nobody yet knew how to make it stop. Inside the conversion building, three men were about to become the faces of Japan's worst nuclear accident. Hisashi Ochi, 35 years old, Masato Shinohara, 39, Yutaka Yokokawa, 54. They had been standing directly next to the precipitation tank when critical mass was reached, when the blue flash erupted, when 19 hours of uncontrolled nuclear fission began. Uchi absorbed an estimated 17 sieverts of radiation to his whole body. To put that in perspective, two sieverts can be fatal. Eight sieverts will kill you within weeks. 17 sieverts is roughly eight times the dose that killed some victims at Hiroshima. Auchi had just received the equivalent of standing at ground zero, eight times over. Shinohara took ten sieverts. Yokokawa, the furthest from the tank, absorbed two to three sieverts. All three immediately began vomiting. Their lymphocyte counts plummeted. Skin erythema spread across their bodies like severe sunburn. These were the textbook symptoms of acute radiation syndrome. But the chain reaction was still going. Still pumping neutrons and gamma rays into the surrounding area, at levels that peaked around 4 millisieverts per hour at the site boundary, 4,000 times normal background radiation. While the three workers were rushed to hospitals, emergency teams faced a problem no one in Japan had trained for. How do you stop a runaway nuclear reaction when you can't get close enough to the source? The answer came from understanding exactly what was keeping the reaction alive. That water jacket surrounding the precipitation tank was acting as a neutron moderator, Fast neutrons from the uranium were slowing down in the water, making them more likely to split other uranium atoms. More splits meant more neutrons. More neutrons meant more splits. It was a feedback loop that would continue until either the uranium was removed or the water was drained. Getting near the uranium was impossible. 
the radiation levels would kill anyone who tried. So, at 2.35 in the morning on October 1st, technicians began the most dangerous plumbing operation in Japanese history. Working in shifts to limit their exposure, they started draining the cooling water from around the tank. From 2.35 to 6.10 in the morning, they systematically removed the neutron moderator that was sustaining the reaction. At 6.14, 20 hours after it began, the chain reaction finally stopped. Neutron levels dropped sharply, the blue glow faded, the atoms stopped splitting. But for Aochi and Shinohara, the damage was already irreversible. Meanwhile, outside the plant, the largest peacetime radiation emergency in Japanese history was unfolding. 161 people within 350 meters of the plant had been evacuated from 39 households. They left everything behind. Their homes, their belongings, their sense that nuclear technology could be trusted. Elementary and middle schools throughout Tokai had closed. 137 schools and kindergartens shut down. Trains stopped running through the affected area. Roadblocks went up on the Joban Expressway at one in the morning, cutting off a major transportation artery. The evacuation zone became a ghost town in the shadow of atoms splitting out of control. By morning, authorities began the massive task of screening the population for radiation exposure. 76,256 residents were checked on October 1st alone, another 1,844 the next day. Most received doses well below dangerous levels. But the psychological impact was profound. This wasn't supposed to happen in Japan. Nuclear technology was supposed to be safe, controlled, predictable. The blue flash from Tokai Mura had shattered that assumption in 19 hours and the worst was yet to come for the three workers who had been closest to the light. At the University of Tokyo Hospital, doctors were attempting something that had never been tried before, keeping a man alive after his DNA had been shattered by 17 sieverts of radiation. Hisashi Aochi's condition defied medical understanding. His chromosomes had been so thoroughly destroyed that his cells could no longer divide properly. His bone marrow, the factory that produces blood cells, had essentially melted, Every day, his body tried to heal itself. Every day, it failed. Doctors attempted experimental treatments, peripheral blood stem cell transplants, medications to boost white blood cell production, round-the-clock monitoring as his organs slowly shut down. Ouchie survived 83 days. He died on December 21st, 1999, three months after Atom split out of control in a tank he had been standing next to. Masato Shinohara lasted longer, his 10 sievert dose, while catastrophic, left him with marginally better chances. He fought for seven months. Shinohara died on April 27, 2000, at Tokyo University Hospital. Two men dead because someone decided that carrying uranium solution in buckets was faster than following safety procedures. But by the time Aochi and Shinohara were dying in hospital beds, investigators had uncovered something even more disturbing than the accident itself. The bucket method wasn't a one-time shortcut. According to the Citizens Nuclear Information Center, JCO had been using unauthorized procedures since 1993. Unapproved manuals had been circulating since 1996. For six years, workers had been systematically bypassing licensed safety equipment. The buffer tank, designed to prevent critical mass. The height-limited transfer system that controlled uranium quantities. All of it ignored in favor of buckets and speed. The morning of September 30th wasn't an accident. It was the inevitable result of institutionalized corner cutting, finally catching up with the laws of physics. Japanese investigators found that JCO had continued pumping uranium solution into the precipitation tank, even as water levels approached the maximum safety threshold. Warning systems either lacked sensitivity or were ignored entirely. When pressure built up inside the system, nobody responded. The Science and Technology Agency and Nuclear Safety Commission confirmed that the operation fell completely outside approved procedures. Hardware safety features had been deliberately bypassed. But JCO's response revealed how deep the problems ran. Company executives denied negligence. They insisted the dam met international standards. They claimed the incident was caused by extreme weather conditions that hit the region that day. Extreme weather. As if rain and snowmelt had somehow caused workers to pour seven times the specified uranium limit into a tank using buckets. JCO President Koji Kitani did apologize publicly to evacuees on the night of September 30th, but the company's legal strategy told a different story. They called it an act of God. Before we jump back in, tell us where you're watching from today, and if this story hits you, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the next one. The government's response was equally revealing. 
Chief Cabinet Secretary Hiromu Nonaka admitted the government response was too slow. Prime Minister Keizo Ibuchi called the situation grave and postponed a cabinet reshuffle. But acknowledging delays wasn't the same as accepting responsibility. It had taken 12 hours from the start of the chain reaction for authorities to issue the shelter-in-place order. 12 hours, while neutrons flew through the air and radiation readings climbed to 4,000 times normal. 310,000 people spent those 12 hours unprotected. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission's after-action review was damning. Root causes included inadequate oversight, weak safety culture, and poor training. The accident was unlikely to happen in the United States, they concluded, because of existing oversight at fuel facilities. Japan's nuclear establishment had failed at every level. Individual workers had ignored procedures. Company management had systematized those violations. Government oversight had missed six years of systematic safety breaches, and when atoms finally started splitting out of control, the emergency response took half a day to protect the surrounding population. On October 11th, 2006 JCO officials were arrested for professional negligence. Three years later, they received suspended prison terms. The company paid fines. No one went to jail for the deaths of Hisashi Aochi and Masato Shinohara. But the accident did trigger Japan's first application of its nuclear compensation law. By September 2000, nearly 7,000 claims had been settled about 12.73 billion yen paid out, a 98% settlement rate for an accident that killed two people and exposed hundreds more. The math of institutional failure had been reduced to a bureaucratic success story. On December 17, 1999, Japan's Diet passed emergency legislation that changed the country's nuclear preparedness forever. The Special Law for Nuclear Emergency Preparedness, Act No. 156, it had taken less than three months from the blue flash at Torkaimura to completely rewrite Japan's approach to nuclear crisis management. The law clarified operator responsibilities, strengthened coordination between national and local authorities, created frameworks for rapid evacuation and public communication. Everything that had failed on September 30th was now encoded in legal requirements. But legislation couldn't bring back Hisashi Uchi and Masato Shinohara and it couldn't undo the psychological damage rippling through Japanese communities. In March 2000, JCO's operating accreditation was permanently cancelled. The company that had systematically ignored safety procedures for six years was banned from handling nuclear materials. The Tokai facility, commissioned just 12 years earlier with a capacity to process three tons of uranium annually, was shut down forever. But the human cost extended far beyond the three workers who stood next to the precipitation tank. Official records list 667 people as exposed to radiation from the Tokaimura accident. The number itself became contested. Different agencies used different dose thresholds, different definitions of exposure. What wasn't contested was the impact on the surrounding community. Rumors sparked boycotts of agricultural and marine products from Ibaraki Prefecture. Hotel cancellations devastated local tourism. The economic damage spread in concentric circles from the epicenter, just like the radiation had, Ibaraki Prefecture eventually offered 4.3 billion yen in low-interest loans to affected small and medium enterprises. Economic compensation for an accident that authorities insisted posed no long-term health risks. The contradictions were everywhere. Environmental monitoring did show the accident's limited scope. Trace radionuclides were detected in vegetation near the exhaust stack, but negligible amounts appeared in water, dairy, or sea samples. The external environmental doses came mainly from neutron and gamma radiation during the 20-hour criticality event itself, not from long-term contamination. Most residents' effective doses were well below 50 millisieverts, the public emergency reference level. Many received less than 1 millisievert, a fraction of natural background radiation. On paper, the Tokaimura accident was contained, localized, manageable. But containment is more than just radiation measurements. Traditional knowledge was lost when people stopped trusting local food sources. Social bonds fractured when neighbors began viewing each other's homes as potential contamination risks. Children learned that the adults responsible for their safety could make mistakes that turned the air itself dangerous. The International Atomic Energy Agency classified Tokaimura as level four on the International Nuclear Event Scale, an accident with local consequences. Local consequences as if the lesson that uranium could go critical in a bucket only mattered to the people within 10 kilometers of the flash. The truth was more disturbing. 
investigation reports revealed that similar shortcuts were probably happening at nuclear facilities across Japan. The Citizens Nuclear Information Center found evidence of unauthorized procedures at other plants. Modified training manuals. Systematic bypassing of safety equipment. Tokaimura wasn't an isolated failure. It was a window into an industry-wide culture that prioritized efficiency over physics. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission concluded that root causes included inadequate oversight, weak safety culture, and poor training, not just at JCO. Throughout Japan's nuclear establishment, post-accident reforms tried to address these systemic problems. Operator responsibilities were clarified. National and local coordination was strengthened. Emergency preparedness regimes were rebuilt from scratch. But culture change is harder than legal change. 25 years later, Tokaimura remains a case study in how nuclear technology's margin for error is measured in atoms. How a decision to use buckets instead of proper equipment can cascade into international headlines, diplomatic tensions, and human deaths. The accident proved that nuclear safety isn't just about engineering. It's about psychology, economics, corporate culture, government oversight. It's about the accumulated weight of small compromises that seem reasonable until atoms start splitting out of control. Hisashi Ochi and Masato Shinohara died because someone decided that following procedures took too long. 667 people were exposed because nuclear safety culture had rotted from within. 310,000 residents were told to shelter in place because 20 hours of runaway fission reminded everyone that some technologies don't forgive human error. Every nuclear facility in the world operates on the assumption that people will follow procedures, that safety systems will work as designed, that the margin between normal operations and catastrophic failure is wide enough to catch human mistakes. Tokaimura proved that assumption wrong. The blue flash that lit up a conversion building in rural Japan for 19 hours wasn't just about uranium going critical. It was about the moment when institutional failure meets the unforgiving laws of physics. And it's still happening. At facilities around the world, where shortcuts seem reasonable, where safety culture erodes one compromise at a time, until someone pours uranium into a bucket and atoms start splitting faster than anyone can stop them. The next blue flash is always just one shortcut away. If this story made you think about how thin the line is between safety and catastrophe, hit that subscribe button and let us know in the comments what safeguards you think should never be compromised. Because understanding these failures is the only way to prevent them from happening again.